Well, the market continues to focus front and centre on geopolitical considerations coming from the Middle East, with news flow now suggesting that Netanyahu is preparing for an imminent ground assault coming through. And we watch that space very, very closely indeed. We see US earnings coming in thick and fast, with some big mega caps having some really big outside moves playing through. We see the, new, the Nasdaq breaking key technical levels as equity markets more broadly are finding few friends in this market, notably in China, where rallies are being sold into on a liberal basis. We see, unlike last week, we see the US dollar finding some form. But can it last? It's time to get in front of the screens. It's the trade-off. Well, hi there. I'm Chris Weston, Head of Research at Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we're going to be going through the various setups that we see in the markets, all the various news flows that are top of mind. Mr. Blake Morrow, I'm going to bring you straight into the program and I'm going to steal a word uh, from Michael Brown. Haven't we got an action packed show for you today? <laughs> you sounded almost just like Michael Brown, but different. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But no, we do. And, we do. Um, you know, there's a lot going on, whether you're talking central banks or we're talking about you know, bond yields after Bill Ackman, um, you know, Came out of his trade, we're sort of back back to where we were, almost back to where we were, testing 5% in tens, uh, 30 year, you know, nicely above 5%, yield curve steepening again. Um, yeah, it looks like the US dollar may find some form. We've got the ECB meeting in the session ahead. Um, and obviously, as I said, um, you know, the geopolitical issue is, is very, very delicately poised and we're, we're prepared to respond you know, when we see the signals coming through you know, energy markets, for, for example, so that's, and, and gold. So that's a really interesting one playing through. The cross currents of, of markets are seeing a lot of de-risking playing through. Um, equity earnings are there. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's plenty, plenty to, um, of opportunities going through the markets. Are you, are you, are you finding it that way? We are. Uh, I mean, you, you know, here's the thing. I, I think a lot of it was positioning from just a couple of days ago. And it's really interesting when you play the positioning card and the, 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 the sentiment when it tries to change. Uh, that day that uh, Ackman said he was getting out of his bond positions, um, you know, we saw we saw yields come off, the dollar reversed. Everybody thought, oh, the dollar's done here because it couldn't rally when yields were going up. So we might as well just stick a fork in the dollar. It it got hit for less than 12 hours and then it ramped right back up every right. up, up everybody's right. butts. And I love it when that happens because then you get people wrong sided. And I love sticking it to people when they when they when that happens quickly. And, you know, the dollar looks looks scary. It does from here. Well, we can talk about that in a minute, but the yeah, Bill Ackman making, I think, a lazy two hundred million dollars on that uh, on the short uh, treasury trade did well. I'm obviously, he doesn't win them all, but uh, certainly a bit of a hero call from that one. Anyway, let's go into topical fun and let's see what's top of the mind. Well, I want to start proceedings, Blake, because we, we, we've seen thirty three percent of S and P companies coming out. I mean, obviously, the one that, that, that everyone's been talking about uh, is is Alphabet. Um, you know. I think it was down nine and a half percent, the biggest fall since March 2020, and you know, obviously the cloud business coming into uh, coming into into call. But yeah, there's been some big moves from some of these these mega cap companies. I mean, you go into sort of tier two names. You got you know Snap had a 24 percent move on the day of earnings, but yeah, the, the earnings haven't been terrible, re you know, relative to expectations. If you're looking at you know, the level of EPS beats and, and sales beats coming through, but yeah, when those companies are missed, they're getting they're getting taken down. But I think if we're looking at the equity story more broadly, and I'm going to bring up a chart in a minute, that that Nasdaq's really you know, broken down through key levels, the September, October double bottom. Um, and that combination of, of, of reestablishment of, of high yields, the discount rate, you know, bringing down the equity risk premium and this, um, you know, the news flow in the Middle East continues to, to make us pretty cautious with you know, Brent prices you know, trading back above 90 bucks. Um, yeah, I think yeah, equities are finding few friends. You go into China, Blake, and yeah, we, we, we saw a you know, the confirmation that they're going to blow the budget deficit out to 3.8% of GDP with, you know, $173 billion of, of, of debt issuance over Q4 um, to support infrastructure and disaster relief. But yeah, equity markets rallied and then just sold straight into. So it is a global issue, but yeah, people are selling rallies at the moment and it feels like the path of least resistance is lower. How are you seeing it? Uh, the the same. I mean, here we here we go trading below forty two hundred. Tomorrow we've got Amazon. I think Amazon's going to be the one to watch, obviously, because uh, you know everybody continues to try to bet against the American consumer. But this is really a global consumer now uh, bucket that we're looking at. Amazon 
is not just in the United States. It is everywhere. So we got Amazon, we've got Intel, a couple of big names. I think we have MasterCard tomorrow as well, or maybe it's on Friday. But, you know, still some big earnings upcoming, Chris. Apple, but you're right. I think it's Nvidia, been, all those names. Yeah. We still got Apple. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, is we are seeing the markets really come under pressure. And this is the time of year where we could get some selling coming in ahead of the holiday season. And, um, I, you know, I'd be really, really cautious because it's not just earnings. It's, as you pointed out, it's geopolitical risks. And, 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 I, and I'll say it like they say it in the movies, shit's getting real over there. You know it's what scary. I mean? And, um, and, and uh, we have to be a little cautious. I think this is the time to be defensive. And, and I think a lot of the, the setups that we're, we've been talking about for weeks here on the trade-off, but also all the topics that are going to be upcoming today are really going to highlight some of the risks that um, that, that we're seeing. And, and I think it's worth noting. Yeah. Right. I think there's two things. So obviously the geopolitical issue, the market is of the yeah, market is looking at how, how well this can be contained. Can other actors come into, into, into the story? And if, if it's contained, obviously it's going to be very dark from a humanitarian perspective, um, sympathies with everyone involved. But um, yeah, I think there's, if the market's saying if it's contained, maybe we can put some risk on. If if it look and, and obviously if we were to see a ground assault, which is looking like that's the case given the news flow, um, you know that that's where markets are going to stay very cautious. Um, the other factor is is Blake. Before we go into the second one, on you know, beginning of next month, we've got a quarterly refunding from the Treasury Department. I think this is part of the reason why you know, yields have been moving up and people have been selling into the into the recent you know, bid that we've just seen. And 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 the idea that yeah you know, we're going to see higher coupon issuance coming through. Um, in that refunding, and that's again just going to increase the perception of supply uh, and keep yields going up at a time when obviously the deficit is about eight percent of GDP, and there's going to be more coming through. So I think that's a really big date as well. So obviously continue to watch um, the geopolitical headlines. Um, at the same time, yeah, we know that the other cross current, which is hitting the equity story, specifically tech, um, is is what's happening in the long end bond market. And you know if if, if that quarterly funding could be a, a a big catalyst, like it was, um, yeah, a couple of months ago. Yeah, it, it it certainly could be. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's shift gears over to the U.S. And you know, you know, I know this is not a U.S. show, and I know we don't like to be U.S. centric. However, um, one of the big highlights this week was uh, going back to the old story that you you you've commonly brought up over the last several months, rightfully so, is the U.S. exceptionalism story. And we had U.K. eurozone PMIs. Well, U.K. were were okay, but the eurozone PMIs were atrocious. Uh, U.S. PMIs came in better than expected. Today, we got housing data that was n new home sales was like, wow. And then then we have, you know, this this U.S. exceptionalism story, or you could say it's still the least dirty shirt in the in the hamper. I know we use that uh, that phrase, phrase or an analogy quite well, a bit. Well, ham hampers, hampers are for picnics, mate. Then <laughs> don't put your clothes no, in. No, no. Well, okay. So that's a that's a U.S. Australia <laughs> thing for sure. Anyway, um, one of the but one of the things that we have upcoming. Well, we have a few different things upcoming. We have durable goods orders. You know, my uh, my my team's really focused on the advanced GDP numbers tomorrow in the U.S. Also on Friday, we have the PCE data. You know, it's the Fed's favorite inflation uh, read. You know, kind of cumulative type of read. Anyway, do you expect U.S. Do U.S. data to continue to surprise the upside? Is this what's going to power the dollar moving forward, Chris? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you know the, the GDP number is expected to be at four and a half percent. So that's your exceptionalism story. The question is, is you know, obviously it's a backward-looking indicator. We're looking into Q4, but consumption's been so strong. You talk about this idea of not betting against the U.S. consumer. Well, the consumer, the consumer is in pretty good shape if you look at various metrics. I know some people looking at other things like credit card data and various things, but generally the, the, the consumer's in pretty good state, and we know the labor market's in in, in rude health at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think you, you, we're trying to understand how Q4 is shaping up, and yeah, it's not going to run at four and a half percent. We're probably looking close towards one percent or so. Um, the auto strikes are going to weigh to an extent. Um, we're, we're likely to get a go we're very likely to get a government shutdown. Um, how long that lasts, obviously, will be yet to be seen. I don't think it will last that long, personally. But yeah, it does feel like consumption is going to come down a little bit, um, and demand will cool. But we're still going to see sort of one percent coming through there. But yeah, absolutely. The um, the, the data in, in, in the US is still relatively better than everywhere else. Um, China's data is actually improving. I think that's when we saw the US dollar playing uh, under a little bit of pressure recently. And that was because, in my opinion, it was, the equity market was coming up, which was a dollar positive. But people were seeing 
um, Chinese data beating expectations and saying, well, you know, from a rest of the world perspective, you know, we're playing a little bit catch up. So I think that's an interesting situation. But when you're looking at the UK, you know, when, when, you, when you're looking at um, you know, emerging markets, when you're looking at um, Europe, for sure, um, yeah, you, yeah, you still want your money in the US, right, for sure. <laughs> But but is it is it just going to be is that going to be the driver or is it everything else that's the geopolitical risk going to be the driver as well? I mean, that's that's the thing about the dollars. The dollar doesn't have just one thing it's hanging on. I think there's a few different things that the dollar, you know, continues to to to, to keep a really big bid and keep the dollar index in breakout territory. Well, that's right. And, um, you know, I think we look into the rates market, for example, and we've paired back a lot of the rate hikes. Um, but I think, yeah, look, you've, you've got to use the dollar tactically uh, at the right time. And I think, you know, if we were to see volatility spike higher, maybe some of the geopolitical news flow, you know, deteriorates further and people want hedges. Well, yeah, I think last week or the week before, yeah, we've seen pretty clearly that people want volatility, people want the Swiss franc, people want gold as, as you, and, and the US dollar less so. But I still think the US dollar is going to perform quite well in that in that environment, especially if equity markets were to, 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 to move markedly lower. I think the US dollar is going to shine in that situation. But Swiss franc will probably be better, in my opinion. Yeah, we'll see. Right. Talking about that, because it's an interesting one, Blake. I mean, I want to, it's kind of a broad subject, central banks. But yeah, there's, if we look at in, in Australia, um, it, yeah, we, we, two weeks ago, we were, everyone was hell bent on believing that the, the RBA were done. Now it's it's widely held consensus the RBA are going to raise on the seventh of November after that CPI print and what we heard from the minutes and from Michelle Bullock. In fact, she's speaking in about five minutes' time from this point. Um, but now she's looking at it, we, 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 the, the, the situation has changed. Uh, we've got the ECB stepping up tonight. Uh, the Federal Reserve are, are going into a blackout period ahead of their meeting. Um, we've got stuff going on in Japan. I'm personally really interested in Bank of Japan. Now, I don't expect major changes, but I think if we're looking, you know, I think a lot of people are getting very excited about the idea that we could have just completely remove yield curve control, which you know, they've made it render it pretty useless, to be fair, after the last tweaks, and maybe go to um, move away from negative interest rates to, to change rates to, to zero. And yeah, it probably won't happen this month. But I think that could have big implications for global bond markets. So I'm, I'm really interested in what's happening in, in Japan, and I'm starting to warm to the yen. I mean, we're obviously on yen uh, intervention watch in Japan because you've got dollar yen pushing 150 and the trade weighted yen's been under a bit of pressure. So I, I think that's I think Japan's a really interesting central bank that, that could have big implications for the yen. Which one have you got? If we have to pick one, which one are you specifically looking at at the moment? Well, that well, I, I think looking at looking at the Bank of Japan, you've got to be looking there because, a, uh, the, the I was surprised the dollar yen has been as as steadfast as it is around the 150 level. That's surprising from a price action standpoint. Even though we pushed above uh, the recent highs, just uh, just in in as we were wrapping up North American trade today. But I think the Bank of Japan, if you think about like what central banks haven't really normalized yet. That's the only one really out there, right? And and so yeah, we got the ECB. ECB is going to be rather interesting, but uh, you know until they they start uh, tweaking the the PEP program, which it might be too early tomorrow. That's it won't that's tomorrow, what the, I think. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the ECB is 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 got nothing. You know, you got every other central bank that's basically going to hold and keep things steady. Uh, you know, we just got pa past the Bank of Canada today. I think your interest in the Bank of Japan is warranted at this point. But what's going to move the yen? I mean, what? What? Because it hasn't caught a bid on the risk aversion. Yeah. Nothing. Yields. I mean, you know, yields have been moving higher. Dollar yen just stopped moving. Uh, you know, gold. It's been moving. Yen's just steady. What's going to move that yen? And, well, I, think, and I guess it has to be the BOJ. Yeah, I mean, right? I think the um, the thing is, is that you've seen ten-year JGBs, Japanese bond yields, moving up to eighty-five basis points, not far from the top end of the range. But bond right. uh, U.S. bond yields have been moving up as well, so you're not getting that yield advantage. And, and certainly, Japanese corporates and pension funds are not going to suddenly go, "Oh, well, we want we want Japanese government bonds because." It's just, yeah, the yield advantage just isn't there. And, you, yeah, you've got that from the hedging numbers anyway. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it has to come from uh, a change uh, from the Bank of Japan. And, and, and you could see a situation where um, at the meeting at the end of the month that they – I mean, they're going to change their inflation forecast. Their, their inflation forecast will move up to, say, 3%. We're looking at core core numbers there. But, 
there's really no reason when you when when you're moving your core inflation forecast above the target to have the policy settings they've got at the moment. There's just it makes it's, it's it's crazy. Um, so when they guide for their inflation forecast on a core basis above their 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 target. I mean, why why are they going to keep it like that? The problem is, is if they make a policy mistake, if they make a communication mistake, it could get very, very, very messy in, in global bond markets. So I think that's the, if you're looking for me at someone who who could cause a significant amount of volatility across there, I think it would be a um, a mishap from the Bank of Japan, given just the level of of, of 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 the market they hold on JGBs and ETFs, and if they were to, you know, to to give a thing that market wasn't prepared for, that 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 would cause huge volatility, not just in JGBs, but in US Treasuries, gilts, bonds, the whole works. I think it would it would send shockwaves. So that's a really interesting one for me. Very interesting, but a lot of a big domino effect. I think it, it is a, is the way I'd I'd, exactly, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd you know, just say it. Um, okay, let's let's move to the last topic and let's talk about gold. Even though we're not going to be showing you a chart in gold, I think most of you are very well aware that we had a 10% move very quick in gold. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about gold at these levels. And I wanted to have a discussion with you, Chris, because uh, I want to know, hey, is it still shiny at these levels? Is it still worth being long? Because there's a, there's a terminology being thrown around the um, internet scape verse uh, about gold and it's war premium, right? It's got a war premium on it. So, and and that's an interesting thought that it does. I think there's more driving gold than just the war premium. However, I do think there is some sort of premium in gold. I, I, I wanna say that the price action is extremely bullish. Uh, we call it in um, Elliott wave terms, that would be a, um, uh, a, a um, uh, impulsive move higher, right? 10% jolt higher. Now it's just consolidating gains. I think while it's above 1950, you got to continue to look higher. But I'm going to warn everybody that if there is a ground uh, offensive uh, from Israel into Gaza, I do think that you have to be careful chasing spikes. I would be buying dips instead of chasing spikes because I do think there's a bit of a war premium. But I think where things shift and gold starts to really move higher is if other players start to enter the picture. And you and I were having this discussion before we flipped on the camera and you, you were talking about a playground. And maybe you can outline that analogy and what that looks like. Because for me, if I start to see other players getting get involved in this uh, Israel, Hezbollah, Gaza situation, that's when gold really starts to catch a bid. Yeah, no, I think, I think I think you're right. I mean... Um, yeah, obviously we're keeping an eye on, on on what happens if they go in and 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 the actions or the the rhetoric from Iran. I think that's that's the big one. So I think yeah, yeah the US will be um, okay. We're not military strategists. I'm not a military strategist, but yeah, I think the the price action in gold will tell you that, and, and I think it will watch very closely around the Brent. Uh, yeah, Brent's going to be your, your your sort of gold go to, and we we see a very you yeah, know test of those sort of ninety seven dollar highs. So that will be. The, I think there's probably some premium already priced into into the into the oil market that that. That we could see some supply disruptions, but yeah, price action will tell you everything. And if, if oil markets move higher, then I think you're going to see gold moving up as well. But the thing for gold, which is for me, I mean, there is just a lack of safe havens out there in the market. If you're a, if you're a multi asset portfolio manager and you're looking for protection or defence in the portfolio, then you know you've either gone to the treasury market historically, but you know treasuries are selling off and yields are going higher, and they've they've been part of the problem behind you know the drawdown in risk. Um, so treasuries are offering you no defence, supply issues that are coming through there and higher for longer and bond vigilantes and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, so you've gone into the Swiss rank, you've gone into um, in, in, into gold. Gold's worked really well. We, we know the we know the form guide. We know case studies, numerous case studies around conflict periods and, and gold does well in that time. So gold has, has been that situation. So, yeah, I mean, if, obviously... Um, you know, if the news flow deteriorates, we see an offensive and, and that brings in other players as a result and the US have to, you know, do something around, you know, with that, then then I think gold prices go you know, into all time highs in that situation. So that that that's where it would be your preeminent hedge. I got I got before we before we move, I I I I was very hesitant and I'm I'm gonna bring it up anyway. I didn't want to really talk about um Bitcoin. Yeah. But Bitcoin's move has been berserko, right? It's just been crazy move. Uh and, and it's you know, we're seeing a little bit of waves and ripples through the rest of the 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 uh the crypto market. But do you think do, would you attribute any of uh Bitcoin's bid to uh, a little bit of risk aversion? Oh. 
You know, I, I, I put it more. It, there had been some school of thought, right? No, but there had been some school of thought. I think at Zero Hedge, yeah, probably. That, you know, these outflows that you've been seeing through Northbound Connect in China, um, that some of that yeah. capital could have been going into, into into Bitcoin. But I mean, obviously, I think I'd probably say 80, 90 percent of the variance has been people getting really excited about the spot ETF. Um, iShares getting theirs away. Obviously, we put we saw we. Yeah, even though I think it's from August, um, the fact that they've listed it on the DTCC, the settlement and clearing system, says it's imminent that we're going to get an SEC, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, regulatory blessing from this. And you know, we've heard no's of grayscale. So I love the price action in, in Bitcoin, but I'd, I'd probably say most of that is going to be attributed down to the fact that people are getting very excited about. Um, you know, financial advisors having this regulated entity to put to their clients and you know, the adoption story pushing through. And obviously, you know, people moving their money out of Bitcoin futures uh, into the spot ETF because you don't pay the roll charge. Uh, you know, you're going to see Bitcoin futures underperforming the spot ETF because of the role that's involved in uh, buying the futures. So I think, yeah, I'd put it down to that personally. There what do you go. guys at home right. think? Because I'm sure there's some big Bitcoin advocates. So there's you know, Chinese money, ETF, spot ETF, um, other factors. Flight to quality, as they say. So I think the Bitcoin thing, I think it looks bullish. I mean, it's hard to say it's anything but bullish, but can it last or does it roll back into the former trading range? That's the interesting one. Anyway, let's go to that's the setup. Well, I've been very focused on the on the NASDAQ and I just want to bring this technical break up because, yeah, obviously we know that a lot of these technical breakers, breaks do fail, but it's been a very powerful force. And a lot of that can be attributed down to what we've been seeing in Google. Um, but, you know, NVIDIA is not trading particularly well at the moment. Um, we have seen Meta and IBM coming out after hours and both stocks are up a little bit in the after hours. We'll see what happens in the cash session in the, in the new trading session. Um, but it feels like, you know, with the discount rate moving up, um, that suddenly maybe these these Nasdaq stocks, these, these yeah, mega cap stocks, these dura long duration assets may take notice. Um, they hadn't before, but maybe they will now. You know, they're, they're certainly trading pretty poorly. And, and the setup that, I've, that I'm seeing here is that, you know, the, the market's closed below that former um, range lows, the double bottom. Um, I mean, I think that's a powerful force. You know, we've got short term moving averages heading lower. Um, it feels to me that the, the probability is that, the, that this market's heading lower at the moment. How do you see this? Well, I see it very similarly, and I, I'll, I'll, I don't, you know, not going to bring up a chart here. Something that we talked about in our community today from one of our traders, he 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 pulled it up as a as as now not on the Nasdaq, but this is the S and P. The S and P is a cup and handle inverted cup and handle. It, it actually those targets go down to four thousand, which isn't far away. I mean, it's not like you know that's unreasonable. And if you think about the NASDAQ 100 moving in that same general direction. I love to look at the S&P. I love to look at the S&P when I'm trading the NASDAQ. I love to look at the NASDAQ when I'm trading the S&P, the Dow, the Russell, because it's all, to me, it's just making sure the wind is blowing the same direction, right? So you've got you've got the S&P breaking down below, uh, below 4,200. You've got the NASDAQ 100. I would be worried about Amazon tomorrow. I think Amazon's going to be a big deal. Um, but, you know, and, and if we, we're going to see... If we're going to see stresses in the U.S. consumer or the global consumer, it's probably going to show up in Amazon's numbers. Well, you've got the retailers, yeah, you know, retailers toward, you know, towards um, in, in a couple of weeks' time. I think they're, they're, you know, Home Depot, you know, those kind of names, Walmart. They're all going to be very, very interesting indeed. They've set off volatility yeah. in, in quarterly reporting seasons before. The other one that, of course, we've got to look at is is our friend Flow. Um, you know, if you were to see realized volatility pick up. And it's realized volatility that the, the you know the, the, these funds look at the, the the volatility dynamic hedge funds who who target a level of of, of 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 volatility in the market and the lower it goes the more equity cash they put into the equity market the higher the, the realized volatility goes yeah the more they take out and I think that's interesting because that sort of mix in with CTA so if realized volatility in Nasdaq and and certainly in the S and P was to move higher it hasn't really so far but if it's realizing higher you're going to get higher VIX but you're also going to see um, a lot of these uh, vol targeting funds, dynamic funds, taking money out of the market. And I think that that would be the thing that causes the next leg down. Obviously, dealers are short gamma at the moment, and that's causing markets to move around quite sharply in the options world. Um, so I think, yeah, flow and, and, and options hedging, I think it, it could be something that that, that that takes this market a little bit lower. Yeah, there you go, because they, they're the ones that held the market up. It can it, Things work in reverse. A lot of people don't understand the markets well, do work in reverse sometimes. Right. And, and, so yeah, we'll uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, take a look at the uh, my first setup, which is going to be the Aussie Kiwi. 
or I, I like to call her the um I like to call her uh Kylie Minogue. That's what we uh, we coin her in the Forex analytics community. I'm not doing that today though. Uh we're gonna I'm just gonna say, hey, is enough enough here? And what's interesting is we saw this really big rip uh last week or two weeks ago when uh New Zealand CPI came in weaker than expected. Then we got the RBA meeting minutes that were more hawkish than expected. This Aussie Kiwi just ripped up from the 106 to 108, testing 109. But you'll notice we're up against a really critical resistance around the 109.30 level. That's that top red line that comes in below that symmetrical triangle resistance. I'm actually looking to trade this as a range, Chris, and that's why this is a setup. I'm looking to buy dips down to 108 because I think as you pointed out, you know, there, you, and you pointed this out just a couple of weeks ago, you're more constructive on the Aussie dollar. And especially against the Kiwi, look how it's performed over the last two weeks. It was a great call, Chris. And I think you can play into that buying dips down at 108. But I'm also looking to sell rallies if I can get this thing back above 109. I'm going to sell into it because I know that my risk is very manageable. So I'd rather play uh, long on the downside or uh, as on dips but I'm also going to sell rallies into that resistance. What are your thoughts here on the Aussie? I think that's the right way to play it. Absolutely. I mean, we've we've priced in a lot. I mean, it's it, it's actually very it's a, the cross is very similar to, to euro sterling. It's a yeah, it's a relative play that, that there's a really low beta or lower beta. Um, you take the dollar out, obviously, of the equation, but it's just a it's, it's a good relative play between Australia and New Zealand from a rates perspective, and that's the cleanest expression of, of policy divergence. But it's had a big move. It's had a material shift up. Um, in, a, in a fairly short space of time, you are coming into that supply zone. So I think that the, the, your call there is the right call. Um, we were saying to people earlier that you know, it's had that shift. A lot's being discounted now um, and you know, into, those, the, into that sort of 109 areas above that level, I think is going to see better supply. And I think that's what we're going to do. But again, that, that given what we're seeing in Australian rates and uh, you know, we, as I say, we're just about to hear it from Michelle Bullock, given that I think we're going to see a rate hike in, 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 um, in, on 7th of November, it still feels like yeah, the downside is fairly well supported. So yeah, I love that. I love the call. I think tactically, uh, it feels like the uh, it feels like the play that, that that needs to happen there. So that's an interesting one. Good chart. Thanks for bringing it up. Let's uh, let's go to Euro Sterling because we've got a viewer question there. Um, if we can bring that up. Sin and um, yeah, I've, I've specifically yeah, you know, got some some focus on gold and crude. But yeah, I wanted to bring up the the bottom question there. And again, if anyone's got any questions around markets or setups they want to look at, we're we're very happy to look at those and and bring them up in the show. So please do um, yeah, bring those up in 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 the questions or the comment section or just how yeah, anything that you're trading in the market. Feel free to be part of the community there. Um, but look at euro sterling. Uh, is it breaking out? What are your thoughts there? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sort of a cup and handle pattern playing through. We've broken through that. I mean, technically. Blake, I think this this looks like it wants to go harder. Um, this has been the widow maker because it's just there's been so many false starts. Everyone sort of sees a breakout and it just falls back. It's been a slow grind, so retail traders typically don't like this one as much because you don't get that, that that big move. But now I just think it's well worth being on the radar because you know it has it has that 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 pattern has has completed. Um, you know, it's difficult, always difficult to buy euros in, in any kind of capacity, certainly against, um, you yeah, know, it's neighbor the pound. But yeah, technically, I feel, I feel like this, this this is this is going to go higher. I mean, it's, it's making all the right sounds, all the right noises. And yeah, so I still like, I, tried, I want to trade this one from the long side. And um, I think this goes higher. How do you see it? Uh, well, first of all, I love that basing pattern that you got there. That's really nice. Breakout, it's a clean breakout. The one thing that you don't see on your chart, but if you took that entire chart, the entire price action that you see there, what you'll see it at 87.40, I think is 87.40, 87.50, right around there, which is only 10, 20 pips higher than where we're currently at. That's the 50% retracement of the entire move. Remember, 50% is not a Fibonacci level, but it is a number that people look at. So if it gets a clean break above 87.40, 87.50 pence, I think the, I think it looks like a big bullish breakout. I mean, you can't really deny it. And a simple ABCD move, it's move is going to take it well above 88 pence, probably closer to 88.50. It looks bullish, Chris. I think you buy yeah. dips here. Well, I think oh, it's one yeah. of those things that obviously could fail. I mean, it's one you, you could put a tight stop just below recent lows and, and just hope this kicks higher. And, and if it does kick higher, then you've got a decent risk reward for that um, situation. So it might get stopped. You get stopped out for a small small loss um, and just ride it, hopefully. Just take a, you know, do something. To, Simple like a systematic uh, um, moving average, you know, stop loss or an ATR stop loss, and, and just yeah, hope this continues to trend. But it's not going to be linear, as we know with a euro sterling, it's going to be it's going to be pretty messy on that way up. But in two weeks' time, it could be you know, 
sitting 150, 200 pips higher. So we'll see what happens. And don't forget about the ECB tomorrow, just if you guys are keeping this one as a setup. All right, let's uh, let's move to the, the last one. And this is also a viewer question. Remember, if you guys and gals have uh, questions of things that you want to see, make sure you bring them up. Uh, this was brought up by Paul, and he he wanted to take a look at silver and how we see it. And, and I'm going to tell you the way that I see it. I see it as an inverted head and shoulder pattern. And so any dip back down towards 22 2210, 2220, I think is the number he was actually looking at. He was looking at 2223. I'd agree. We got a little inverted head and shoulder pattern with a neckline just above that 200 day moving average, which comes in around 2375. If that breaks, then we have a clear, you know, in my opinion, we have a move that will take us well above 25. Now, I think silver will continue to underperform gold. And that has that happens when you have the X XAU uh going up against the xag that that tends to happen during periods of risk aversion but that doesn't mean that silver can't be dragged higher by its pigtails on the way up as as gold breaks higher so i like silver right now as long as it's above 22 bucks chris how are you seeing silver at this point yeah i think that's an, an interesting setup i think I, i'd prefer to play that from the long side and then that completes the uh, the right shoulder um and that probably takes you yeah like to, to the downtrend playing through but yeah i mean i think it's a similar Similar situation that we're seeing in, in gold. Uh, I, I have a preference for gold, um, but yeah, I mean, I think if, if like you say, if if, if gold's going higher, um, then silver as well. But I think, yeah, I, mean, I have no insights about how, how the situation's gonna go in, in, in the Middle East. Um, obviously, if we do feel like it's gonna be contained, then then you're gonna see gold sellers, silver sellers, but if it, if it, if it takes a, a, a worsening situation, then both silver and gold are going to go up. So we know for a fact, just looking at the price action, how it's reacting to headlines, that it's an out and out geopolitical hedge. Uh, so really, you, you know, you, you got silver or you got gold more prominently as a, as a hedge against that. And that's really what it's being used at. It's completely overlooked the move we've been seeing in real rates. The correlation with 10 year real rates, five year real rates has broken right down. It's broken out, it's broken from that correlation with the US dollar. So both of these are just pure out and out um, geopolitical hedge in a world where you're finding scarcities of defensive assets, yeah, gold and to a lesser extent silver, um, you know, are, are, those, are those hedges that people want in the portfolio. So really, you're making a play um, on on you know, what's happening in in headlines and, and geopolitics. That's that's where you're going to get those, um, those those moves really. Anyway, let's move on to play of the day. Yeah, first one I want to bring up is, is Kiwi Yen. Last week I looked at uh, the New Zealand dollar against the Swiss franc and, and that's come down a little bit. Um, but I just want to switch it a little bit into, into, into Kiwi Yen from Kiwi Swiss. And the reason I want to do that is, is look, what I like about this is that you've got that double top in play. You, it, it, I, want to, I want to sell this on a close below that neckline because then you've got the technical downside that offers you a nice move down into 84. So you're trading the technicals, all the short term moving averages are heading lower. Um, but it looks like there's a weight of money just sucking it down. Um, if we believe that that, that we are going to see um, you know higher risk aversion playing through markets, then the Kiwi is is, is probably one of the best currencies to be short. Um, what I'm seeing is is those China proxies um, rallies are being sold into. The market's not sensitive to the improvement in in data in China. They're not sensitive to what we're seeing in liquidity, and they're selling rallies there, and that that's keeping me somewhat cautious on China proxies for now. The other big kicker, though, of course, if we were to see intervention as we've dollar yen above 150 and the and traded weighted yen coming under pressure if we were to see a quick rip because there's headlines that they're ringing around the houses checking levels um, then you're on the right side of the yen as well so you've got the technicals working um you know you've got a hedge against kind of concerns around high volatility and equity drawdown and geopolitical issues but you're on the right side uh, of the yen if we were to see intervention as well so i like that trade yeah, and you know, nothing warms my heart, Chris, more than when you have a, a play of the day that I'm already in. Oh, and I'm sweet. sure if you, yeah, it's, it's, it, it just, you know, I've been positioned New, short New Zealand yen for the last couple of weeks based on this show, one of the setups that we had. And uh, nothing, nothing makes me feel better than that, Chris. Well, it's it's, just, it's nice that. as well to know that you've got that. You know, whilst you necessarily say, oh, yeah, I don't necessarily think there's going to be intervention from the Bank of Japan. But if there was from the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Japan, at least you know that, that, that you've got that on the right side. You're not going to see a, five, a, a three, four hundred pip rip to the upside. Um, it's just not going to happen. But you could easily see a three, four hundred pip rip to the downside, uh, which obviously benefits the trade there as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, my play of the day, guys and gals, is going to be the dollar mex. 
Uh, surprise, surprise! But we're going to be covering. We're going to be. We're going to be celebrating the Day of the Dead. If you guys didn't know what the Day of the Dead is, it's not anything morbid. November first and second is a day that Mexico celebrates their ancestors, people that have passed away. It's kind of like a reunion with uh, and and a celebration of their of their life and 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 a reunion in the afterlife, if you will. So Day of the Dead, you know, you could see all the uh, you know a lot of the Mexican and and. Uh, and Hispanic cultures will wear the mask. It's really, really, a uh, really cool celebration uh, that a lot of us um, uh, partake in in the southern United States. Anyway, but the Mexican peso is what I'm looking to die uh, here is a possible breakout above <laughs> above 1850 because this is that 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 descending trend line. It actually even goes further than what you're seeing right here, but it's basically a channel. And as long as we stay above the 200 DMA and basically above, you know, 1775, I'm looking for a break above the 1850 level to target 1873 and eventually, eventually towards 1920. So that's uh, that's what I'm looking for in the uh, dollar max. And I'm looking for a top side breakout. And remember, you got Banksico on your side as they are reducing their... Um, you know, their their emergency uh, program that they have instilled since uh, COVID. So um, lockdown. Yeah, they're hedges. Yeah. yeah. So there Good you go. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks, Blake. Um, all right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for staying with us. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, give us a like if you can. Um, leave a comment. It helps us to more people to see the show. Um, and really appreciate you sticking around. Thanks to see, uh, see you guys next week for more of the trade-off.